Good morning, everyone. Good to see y'all. Uh, if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles 15. Let us go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time you give us together as a local body of believers. Gather together around your word, Lord, that we might grow as your disciples, become more mature, better witnesses to the world, better brothers and sisters to one another, Lord. That which you would have us be, your church. So, Lord, please be with us as we continue our studies now in First Chronicles, and uh, let us grow, Lord, as you would have us grow. For your greater glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, when we ended our study of chapter 14 last week, we had covered the chronicler's report of David's palace being built by the craftsmen of Hiram of Tyre, along with their cedar trees. We saw David marry more wives and have more children, and we saw him fight two different battles with the Philistines, both of which had David and his army being led by God, and thus both resulted in victory for the Israelites since God had done the heavy lifting. This resulted in a period of peace for Israel, one in which David could finish building his palace, and more importantly, one in which David could successfully bring the Ark of the Covenant into their capital city, Jerusalem. This is what we'll cover today in chapter 15 of 1 Chronicles, and we'll see what David did right this time in attempting to move the ark versus his first attempt recorded in chapter 13. I've outlined chapters 15, chapter 15 as follows. Verses 1 through 3 gives us David's building plan, his instruction on who is to move the ark of the covenant and who is to attend this movement, this, this great celebration. Verses 4 through 10 show us the gathering together of the priests and the Levites. Verses 11 through 15 give us David's instructions on how to properly move the Ark of the Covenant. Verses 16 through 24, we see him appointing the singers and the musicians to celebrate the journey of the Ark. Verses 25 through 28 show the actual moving of the Ark into Jerusalem, which We'll end with our chapter right before they get into Jerusalem. In verse 29, uh, it just ends with a little bit of marital discord in David's house. So then with this outline in mind, let's begin our study of 1 Chronicles chapter 15 by reading verses 1 through 3. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. Okay, in beginning, please note the only additional information we are given here about David's palace is the first clause of verse 1. The major focus here is on the Ark of the Covenant and the place being prepared for it. The term houses for those buildings David built for himself were most likely additional buildings built within the palace area. In other words, a palace wasn't just one large ornate building. The king needed places for all of his wives and children to live as well as rooms for the administration of the government. Then we see that David prepared a place for the Ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Now, I have to give you a clear picture of what's going on here. I say that because when we hear Ark and then we hear tent, we naturally think of the tabernacle. But that's not what's taking place here. Even during this time of obedience to God, Israel had left the true Mosaic law model of how worship was to be conducted. We know from chapters 25 through 27 of the book of Exodus how the tabernacle was to be constructed and that it was to house the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. The Israelites were then to go 
to the tabernacle and to offer their sacrifices to God in His very presence. Well, at this time in history, the actual tabernacle was in Gibeon, which was northwest of Jerusalem, a city we looked at last week in relation to David defeating the Philistines. And yes, we can tell from looking at this, I noticed when I had it that it looks like it was probably made on a computer about 20 years ago or so, doesn't it? <laughs> the structure, isn't this? Getting back in time there. But that's where the actual tabernacle is. But the Ark of the Covenant had not been in the tabernacle since the Israelites removed it and took it into battle with them against the Philistines and lost it to them back in 1 Samuel chapter 4, which was even before Israel had its first king. Saul wasn't even king yet. Once the Philistines returned it, the ark was taken to the house of an individual. Samuel, meanwhile, after the destruction of Shiloh, reconstructed the tabernacle back in Gilgal, but he did it without the ark being present. Now that separation continued up until this period in David's life. But the fact is, the ark and the tabernacle aren't going to be reunited until Solomon builds the temple for God. So when we read that David pitched a tent for the Ark of the Covenant, he's just setting up a special spot and a tent to protect it from the elements until he could build a temple, because remember, David wants to build a temple at this point, until he could build the temple to hold the tabernacle. The tabernacle itself, where the priests served and sacrifices were made by all of Israel, was still up in Gibeon, which you can confirm by reading 1 Chronicles chapter 16, which we'll be covering next week, and also chapters 21. Chapter 21. Then in verse 2, David says, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. So when we read this, I think it begs a comparison with chapter 13, where David attempted to do a right thing the wrong way in his first attempt to bring the ark into Jerusalem. Back in chapter 13, we saw David consult with all of his military leaders and with all of the assembly of Israel about bringing the ark up to Jerusalem. He included the priests and the Levites because they were part of the overall population. Remember, we were told back then, all of Jerusalem, or all of Israel came to, to bring, the, bring up the ark. But he didn't make a big deal over their participation. Instead, he and all of Israel went on to kirjath Jerim to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. They put it on a cart and started back with it. Now, David has apparently consulted the Mosaic Law and says, No one may carry the ark of God but the Levites. For the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. This time only the Levites will handle the transportation. And note, they will carry the ark as God had commanded. They won't put it on a cart as the Philistines did when they returned it to Israel. And then David once again gathers all of Israel to join in this celebration of bringing the ark to Jerusalem. But he has already properly established how it will travel. And to add some great specificity to this instruction, the chronicler will now list the priests and the Levites who participated in the correct moving of the ark. Remember, the chronicler is writing to post-exilic Israel, those back in the land after the 70 years in Babylon, who need to not only now rebuild the temple in the city of Jerusalem, but also rebuild their knowledge and practice of the Mosaic law system that God instituted so that they may worship God as he instructed. So all of this is meant to convey this need effectively to these people. So let's read verses 4 through 10. Then David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites, of the sons of Kohath, Uriel the chief, and 120 of his brethren, of the sons of Merari, Asiah the chief, and 220 of his brethren, of the sons of Gershom, Joel the chief, and 130 of his brethren, of the sons of Elizaphon, Shemaiah the chief, and 200 of his brethren, of the sons of Hebron, Eliel the chief, and 80 of his brethren, of the sons of Uziel, Aminadab the chief, and 112 of his brethren. 
Okay. Concerning this group, we know from Genesis chapter 46, 11, that the first three sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. In some passages, we find the first son's name spelled Gershom, as we have here. Now, Kohath's oldest son was Amram, and his sons were Aaron and Moses. Aaron was chosen by God to head the line of priests for Israel. So all other Kohathites, aside from Aaron's line, are Levites functioning in the support roles of the Levites, along with the descendants of Gershon and Merari. These are the men we see listed here, 868 in number, including those des designated as chiefs. The three additional names, Elizaphon, Hebron, and Uziel, are from the clan of Kohath. Hebron and Uziel actually being additional sons of Kohath, and Elizaphan being a descendant of Uziel. We aren't told why these additional subgroups have been singled out by the chronicler. The thought is it may be due to their assisting in carrying the ark, because this is, this is a big thing. So now that David has specifically organized the priests and the Levites, let's read verses 11 through 15 to see the instructions he gives them. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests and for the Levites, for Uriel, Asahiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab. He said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us, because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Okay, David begins this section by making a very important point. But first he calls together the people who need to hear his point, starting with the two specific priests, Zadok and Abiathar. These were the two chief priests under David's administration. Zadok is clearly shown in the lineage of Kohath through Aaron and will serve faithfully as a high priest. However, Abiathar's lineage through Aaron by Ithamar is debated. In 1 Kings, Abiathar is noted as being from the house of Eli. And due to his supporting a candidate to replace David as king, Solomon, when he becomes king, will banish Abiathar to his home in Anathoth, which we're familiar with because that was also the home of Jeremiah. Thank you. He's going to banish him there and remove him from the priesthood of Israel. But that's all in the future. That's not now. Here in David's reign, these two are his chief priests. And the representatives of the Levitical families are the same family heads we just covered in verses 4 through 10. One each from each major tribe uh, from Levi and three more from the tribe of Kohath. And David tells them to sanctify themselves in the King James and my new King James, to prepare themselves to bring the ark into Jerusalem. The New American Standard, the English Standard Version, and the Net Bible all say that they are to consecrate themselves. Well, the Hebrew word here is kadash, and it literally means to be physically clean and pure and or ceremonially clean and pure or as Mark Boda put it, to set apart for use in the realm of the divine. So David here is telling these priests and Levites to do whatever is commanded of them in the Mosaic law to make sure they are properly clean and pure for carrying the Ark of the Covenant to the place that David has prepared for it. 
So both of our English terms, consecrate and sanctify, may be used to express this Hebrew thought of literal and ceremonial cleansing. And David then makes his important point regarding this in verse 13. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. If you go back and read the first account of David's attempt in 1 Chronicles chapter 13 or 2 Samuel chapter 6, you'll see that David gathered all of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, went to the house of Abinadab, put the ark on a cart, and headed toward Jerusalem. Just like that. Nowhere in either report do we find the priests or the Levites going to King David and saying, wait a minute, we need to do this the proper way. We need to be cleansed and we need to carry the ark on poles as instructed in the law of Moses. Nowhere do we see any of that, which is why David points it out here. He starts by laying the blame where it should be on their shoulders. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us. This was the responsibility of the priest to point this out and make it clear to the king. It was not his responsibility. Yet in his humility, David does not leave the full responsibility on their shoulders. He ends his statement by saying, because we did not consult him about the proper order. As Dr. Bailey pointed out two weeks ago, this is why David was a man after God's own heart. Not because he didn't sin, but because he was always willing to admit his, admit his sin before God, and in cases like this, before all of Israel as well. So then, in verses 14 and 15, we see the ark being approached in the manner prescribed in the Mosaic law. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring the ark of the Lord God of Israel, to bring up the ark of the Lord God Israel, of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Now, as we said previously, the first time they attempted to move the ark, they erroneously put it on a cart instead of using the poles to carry it as instructed in the law of Moses. And we know what happened with that. Now, back in the actual first instructions given in the book of Exodus, such as that found in chapter 30 of Exodus, chapter 30, verse 4, the Hebrew word is budim, which means a pole, a branch, or a bar. Very simply, that's all it means. But here in 1 Chronicles 15.15, 15, the Hebrew word translated as poles is motah, which means bars of a yoke, speaking of a yoke such as an ox would wear. So it's thought that as the centuries progressed after the time of Moses, that the poles to carry the ark may have been progressively modified to include some type of frame or cradle structure on them to hold the ark more securely. Of course, because remember, they've been walking they were 40 years in the desert, walking up and down over rocks and mountains, great distances, they may have said, you know, before this, before Uzzah, you know, this could be the Uzzah modification. But, you know, maybe before that, you know, they looked at it and said, you know, maybe we can improve this a little bit to make it easier. So that might be what we're talking about here. So now all is in proper order for the moving of the ark. David can now concentrate on the celebration that is to accompany the journey of the ark. Let's read verses 16 through 24. Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, and cymbals, by raising the voice with resounding joy. So the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel, and of his brethren, Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of their brethren, the sons of Merari, Ethan, the son of Kushaya, and with them their brethren of the second rank, Zechariah, Ben, Jaaziel, Shemiramoth, Je Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, Benaniah, Maasiah, Mathathiah, 
Elephaleh, Machneah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, the gatekeepers. The singers Heman, Asaph, and Ethan were to sound the symbols of bronze. Zechariah, Aziel, Shemiramoth, Jahiel, Uni, Eliab, Maasiah, and Benaiah with strings according to Alamoth. Mattathiah, Elephaleh, Magniah, Obed-Edom, Jael, and Azaziah to direct with harps on the Sheminith. Shenaniah, leader of the Levites, was instructor in charge of the music because he was skillful. Barakiah and Elkanah were doorkeepers for the ark. Shebaniah, Josaphat, Nethanel, or Nathanel, Amasai, Zechariah, Benaniah, and Eleazar, the priests, were to blow the trumpets before the ark of God, and Obed-Edom and Jehiah, doorkeepers for the ark. So, as we can see, David knew the exact order in which he wanted these celebrants to move forward once they had the ark. First, he names the instruments to be used in support of the singing. In my New King James, we have stringed instruments, which are not specifically identified, followed by harps and cymbals. In the Hebrew, however, the stringed instruments is actually the word for harps, and the word for harps is actually the word for lyres. So this list should be harps, lyres, and cymbals. So you ask, what is the difference between a harp and a lyre? Well, that depends on the period of history you're discussing. But back in David's day, some of the basic differences may have applied, such as harps were tuned in fifths and lyres were tuned in fourths, for you mus musicians out there. Harps used metal strings while lyres used gut strings. And harps had their strings arranged to make it easy to play chords, whereas lyres were meant to be played one string at a time. We're then given the names of the individuals who will march in this parade from each of the descendants of Levi. We are told which ones will play the cymbals, which will play the harps, and which will play the lyres. In this list, we are given the name of Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and you may remember him as being a writer of psalms as well. We are also told who the conductor or concertmaster is. Chenaniah, leader of the Levites, was instructor in charge of the music because he was skillful. My New King James and the English Standard Version say that he was in charge of the music. The New American Standard says that he was in charge of the singing. And if you think that isn't different enough, the Net Bible says he was in charge of transport because that's another translation of this word. So he could have just been the road manager, you know, getting, getting, getting all this going, you know. Or, but most of them say he was either in charge of the music or he was in charge of the singing. This verse in Hebrew actually doesn't specify either of these areas. It simply says that he carried the burden of instructing. But since one of the Hebrew words, the word masa, which essentially means burden, also means lifting, because that might be involved in dealing with burden, it means lifting or uplifting. Because of that, some have taken that to refer to voices and translate this verse to say that he was in charge of the singing. They are also influenced in this translation by verse 27 that we'll be looking at, that will tell us that Chenaniah was with the singers. In verse 20, the harps are told to play according to Alamoth, which in Hebrew means young woman. So it's thought that these harps were meant to play in a higher register. In verse 21, the lyres are told to play on the Sheminith, which means on the eighth. So this is thought to mean possibly a lower eighth or playing down in the bass range. In verse 18, we are given the names of some gatekeepers. It's thought that these were the men who were the keepers of the gates of the tabernacle to keep it secure from violation of its sanctity. Then in verse 23, we are given two doorkeepers of the ark. And in verse 24, we are given an additional two doorkeepers of the ark. These four men probably stood two in front and two in back of the ark to protect it on its journey. And in between them and the ark were seven priests who were to blow trumpets. Now, these were not the shofar trumpets or ram's horn trumpets, usually used mainly in war. These were long, straight silver tubes with a bell end like a coronet that were used primarily for joyous occasions. 
So this was a loud musical vocal ensemble moving from the home of Obed-Edom to the city of Jerusalem. And no, we don't know the distance from Obed-Edom's home to Jerusalem. Estimates go from three to four miles all the way up to 40 miles. Although I can't personally see this going up for 40 miles, but I don't know. Because it's all conjecture because we aren't told anywhere where the house of Obed-Edom was. But however long the journey was, now that we know all who was involved and all the music instruments and the singers, we can get on with the journey itself. Let's read verses 25 through 28. So David, the elders of Israel, and the captains over thousands, went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Odom, Edom, Obed-Edom with joy. And so it was when God helped the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they offered seven bulls and seven rams. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who bore the ark, the singers, and Chenaniah, the music master, with the singers. David also wore a linen ephod. Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting, and with the sound of the horn, with trumpets and with cymbals, making music with stringed instruments and harps. So verse 25 gives us the government leadership group or of representatives who went with the musicians and singers and the rest of Israel to bring back the ark to Jerusalem. And we see that on the way that they offered sacrifices to the Lord, stated here as being seven bulls and seven rams. Now, from the wording of the chronicler, it sounds like the offerings were made by the Levites. And we know that they did indeed have two chief priests and seven additional priests with them. So they had the needed personnel for making sacrifices. However, there is some scholarly controversy over this section. You see, in the corresponding section of 2 Samuel chapter 6, we are told that he, he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. And in our section of 1 Chronicles in verse 27, we see that David was wearing a linen ephod, which was like a skirt. What's distinct about it is the ephods were usually worn by the priests. So some speculate here that David himself offered up these sacrifices to the Lord. We also see David making such offerings in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 17, and chapter 6, verse 18. So there are differing views on this. Some say that the reference in 2 Samuel 6.13 saying that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep is just stating that David, as king, was the leader overseeing the priests and Levites making the actual offerings. But that does not account for the other passages in 2 Samuel that clearly state that David was the one in those cases making offerings. I think Dr. Eugene Merrill might have the best view on these actions of David. In his commentary on 1 and 2 Chronicles, Dr. Merrill makes the following observations. First, it was common in the ancient Near Eastern world for kings to be priests or to conduct themselves as such. Second, this of course is not sufficient by itself to show that the kings of Israel would be invested with this privilege. However, Saul had offered sacrifices, the prophet Samuel's rebuke having only to do with the fact that he did so peremptorily. And so later on, we also see David making sacrifices as well as Solomon making sacrifices. So we do have scriptural evidence showing the permissibility of kings of Israel acting as priests for the offering of sacrifices. It is thought that the sacrifice offered by David in 2 Samuel 6.13 another version of the account we're in, which says the sacrifice was made after the ark had gone six paces. Of course, that sacrifice was made, was made right at the beginning of the journey. Whereas the sacrifice listed here in 1 Chronicles 15, 26, when God had, had helped the Levites who bore the ark, was made after the ark arrived in Jerusalem. So we may have two different sets of sacrifices being offered at two different times here. We then see that David and the entire retinue were clothed in fine linen robes and that Chenaniah was with the singers. The Hebrew actually saying Chenaniah, the leader with the burden of the singers. The burden thought to be the responsibility for the music. 
And we then see that the journey was made with all the music and singing that David had envisioned and in great joy. King David was dancing before his Lord. However, not everyone agreed with his actions. Let's read verse 29. And it happened, as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, that Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David whirling and playing music, and she despised him in her heart. Notice that the chronicler doesn't make much of this event, because, I mean, it's this one verse, because his focus is more on David's kingly activities, leading the nation of Israel rather than his personal life. He probably included it because he started his historical account of David, after we finished all those wonderful genealogies, um, with King Saul's death. And this comment regarding Saul's daughter continues to point out the difference between Saul and David. We're given a much fuller report of this event in 2 Samuel chapter 6, where we read this in verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Well, we must remember that Michael was the son of the, 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 pardon me, the daughter of Saul, and she grew up with her dad as king. Saul apparently always presented a dignified image of power as a king. And that was probably what Michael expected from David. Her dad never showed humility before the Lord. So this was something with which she was unfamiliar. But in the true explosive temperament of her father, Michael doesn't try to consider David's behavior at all. She just immediately despises him in her heart for it. As I said, the chronicler here doesn't relate more of this event because his focus is on David as king and his administration. But the report in 2 Samuel in, his, in David's response to Michael shows us his heart in this enterprise. So David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me as ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. David was joyous to honor his Lord. He knew who was the source of his life, his victories, and who the author of all his success was. And it wasn't done to his own efforts. He recognized that he was but a servant of the Most High God and felt no prestige and sought no prestige for himself. He stood humble before his God and wanted all of his people to see this, that they too might have this type of relationship with God, one of humble servitude. Just think, in doing this, David was not only a great, a great example to his subjects, but also to us today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, every word in, your, in the Bible is just so meaningful and so rich, Lord. We can just learn so much and see so much to apply. And seeing here the King of Israel, Lord, just dancing and joyously celebrating you, Lord, and always thankful to you, Lord, and not not appearing as if, he, not putting himself first, putting himself forth as something great, Lord. Just always seeking your consultation on anything that he did, Lord. And it's just his humble approach in being king before his people should show us so much, Lord, because we are so blessed to be your children. We are thankful for salvation, Lord. It is your gift to us that is shed blood of your son, Jesus. It is not of anything we have done, not of works so that no man may boast. So Lord, once we are saved, and, and please keep us thankful every day for this, for this great gift. And let us be eager to take it forth to the world that needs to hear it, Lord, 
because they're in the same position that we were, Lord. All of us were born into this world as sinners, Lord. And some of us came to you sooner than others, Lord, but we were all sinners to start with. So, Lord, we should identify, know where they are, and just have a, have a heart for them, Lord, because they have, they have nothing but uh, a life here on earth as long as they live of, of something missing in their lives, of no answers to essential questions, of, of frustration and seeking answers in all the wrong places, Lord, unless they hear your word. And even then, Lord, Lord, that doesn't guarantee anything. But Lord, you have just given us the task of taking that word out so that they can hear the truth of your son, Jesus. So Lord, keep us humble and keep us going forth as your servants to do this work that you might be glorified in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.